In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Today we keep the commemoration of St. Peter, the martyr, sometimes called Peter of Verona, who suffered a martyr's death in the year 1252. St. Peter was a Dominican. As a young man growing up at not far from Milan, his family were Manichaeans. Now we have to remember, even in the Middle Ages, uh, what we think of as the Age of Faith, heresy has never been far from the church. And the church has always been plagued by these heresies. And many of these heresies, of course, they all spring out of the early church, the third, fourth century, and none of them ever go away. They just kind of get rebranded and they morph into something different. But the root of these heresies just continue down through the ages. <clears throat> the Manichaeism. Manichaeism was started by a man named Manich Manichae. And Mani was uh, from what today would be present-day Persia, Iraq, Iran, in that area. He was a Christian, so-called, baptized a Christian. But he was always interested in philosophy and religion and everything else. And in that part of the world, there were mainly two great religions. There was Christianity, which had come in the previous two centuries. And then there was the ancient religion known as Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism was built around the zodiac and uh, the study of the stars. And the Magi, for instance, were Zoroastrians who become converted. And they become the first Christian evangelist. Uh, to proclaim the coming of the Messiah and the coming of the Christian message. That's why in that part of the world, the Christian faith took off very quickly because the Magi had done their homework and prepared the people for the preaching of the gospel. But the old religion doesn't die out. Even today, Zoroastrianism is still around. And in fact, I read recently that in Iran, uh, there are many, many young people that are doing one of two things. They're either becoming Christian or they're going back to Zoroastrianism, the ancient religion uh, of the Iranians. Uh, Zoroastrianism, uh, again, taught a cosmopology that was very different from the Christian worldview. And then, of course, Mani was also influenced by Buddhism because there were Buddhist traders coming from the northern part of India and even China uh, trading in that part of the world with silks and other things. And so, it was a whole bunch of ideas that were floating around. And so Manny gets it in his head, and he begins this heresy, which basically taught a duality, that God was the creator of the spirit world, and that everything that is spirit is good, whereas everything that is flesh is evil. And so the world was created by Satan. And so when Satan fell from God's glory, uh, Satan created his own little world, and that was the world we live in, the physical world, created by Satan. And everyone that's born into this, into this world are born into Satan. And so baptism frees us from that kingdom of Satan, uh, but not completely. And so what Manny taught was that as you mature, you have to come to a conversion of your mind. And so your mind has to be elevated to the life of the spirit, and not concerned with the life of the flesh. And so the Manichaeisms, when Manichaeus went in one of two directions. There were those who became totally ascetic, that they gave into nothing, and they, so they beat their bodies. They, they lived horribly penitential lives because the flesh represented Satan and evil. And so they wanted to be freed from that, so they were trying to live this angelic life, which of course uh, in the flesh is very, very difficult, well, very impossible. Whereas the other group, and that would be the majority of them, came to the conclusion, well, what we do in the flesh really doesn't matter because this, is the, this flesh is condemned anyway. It belongs to the devil. And what's important is we live the life of the spirit. Uh, and so they began to live immoral lives because it didn't matter what you did in the flesh. It only mattered what you had in your mind and how your mind believed and how your mind was attuned to the goodness of God and to the grace of God. Uh, and so we see where the problems come in. Uh, the church condemns Manichaeism all throughout the history of the church, even till today. Uh, St. Augustine started out as a Manichaeist, and so he was able to live what he thought was a religious life while even living a sinful life. Uh, we find that this continued through the ages. Uh, the Cathars that had a resurrection around the 10th and 11th century in France these were Manichaeists. And the Cathars also spread their error into northern Italy, 
uh, that would take form in all kinds of ways. And that's why the church was very, very careful about approving these mendicant groups, uh, penitential groups. Uh, we think of St. Francis. There was a great resistance at first because there had been many of these mendicant little groups of holy men, uh, and they all went off into Manichaeism. They all became heretics. And so the church was very careful of these people. Think of Peter Waldo, uh, who a century before uh, does the very same thing that Francis tried to do, but he becomes a Manichaeist, and so the whole thing just kind of reborns itself. Uh, and so the church was very, very careful of these groups, and so Francis had to ha hammer down over and over again to his disciples that above all things we are faithful Catholics and we must remain Catholic in everything that we do. That's why for the early Franciscans were very big almost immediately in starting higher education so that their men were well educated in the truth of the Catholic faith. Uh, but anyway, this heresy continues on. It would be in the 13th century that Peter was born. His family, again, were Manichaeists. Uh, his uncle was kind of the big boss and very much imbued with this heresy. But as a young man, Peter turns away from it. And he embraces the true Catholic faith. He's baptized into the Catholic faith, and after a short period of time, he enters the Dominicans. And as a Dominican, he studies very hard, he learns the faith, he learns the arguments that he could use, and with that, he begins to start out on mission. And the mission he has is to preach about, preach against the Manichaeisms, Manichaeists, and try to win them back to the Catholic faith. And like so many great saints, he was very successful at what he did. So successful uh, that that becomes the reason for his martyrdom. He's a little too successful. Uh, he's bringing back multitudes of people back into the Catholic faith. And this, of course, raises the anger of the real staunch Manichaeist. And so on a cruel plot, uh, they lay wait for him. And with an axe, uh, he suffers his martyrdom. Again, because they believe that there were two gods, the God the Father who created the heavens and Satan God who created the earth. And so it was said that as he was laid dying on the road, Peter took his hand and put it in the blood. And with his own blood, he writes on the walk, he writes, I believe in one God, meaning one God who created everything. And so it was his final testament uh, to the truth of the Catholic faith. And with that, he suffers his martyrdom. Certainly this heresy continued <clears throat> all throughout the times of the church. It exists today. Uh, it morphs. It constantly changes its form. And even in the time of the so-called Reformation, we had people like Martin Luther and John Calvin who found it more and more increasingly difficult to live a moral life. And so what do you do? Well, you either give up your faith or you adapt the faith. And that's what they did. And that's really what Protestant is. It was an adaption. Uh, to uh, compromise. And so the Protestant idea was that it didn't matter what you did, there's Manichaeism, what mattered is you had the right belief and that your mind was in the right place. Today we hear these evangelicals, we just have to say, Jesus come into my heart and you know that no matter what you do, your sins are forgiven. That's Manichaeism all over the place, right back to the fourth century. It's just pure Manichaeism. And so it still exists, even in our day to day. Uh, sadly, sometimes even in the Catholic Church, we have to be very careful of what we hear, because that Manichaean spirit, spirit can still kind of be around. I remember people my age, I mean, you know, my, 45 years ago I was in the seminary, and I can remember back then we were warned uh, when I was in my novitiate. Uh, our novice master warned us when we get to the theologate, he said, I'm told they're teaching this and be very careful. And so he gave us numerous conferences to be careful of this Manichaean spirit. And it kind of manifests itself in the late 60s and 70s, uh, even into the early 80s, uh, in a teaching called fundamental option. We were taught that. Uh, we were, again, they were careful how they presented it because it was being condemned already. But the fundamental option taught that it really doesn't matter what, pers what a person does day to day. You know, God doesn't look at the things that you do day to day. God looks at the overall picture of your life. And so if the overall option, that's fundamental, if the fundamental option of your life is to follow the will of God and to be a devout Christian, eh, the little stuff on either side, God doesn't pay attention to that. 
Uh, there's no accountability for the little sins you commit, sometimes even the big sins. Because God's not looking at those things. He's looking at your option, the option to love God. That's Manichaeism, right? It's all over the place. Uh, it was condemned very strongly by John Paul II and was forbidden to be taught. Uh, and even he made a little thing about priests that were instructed in this need to be re-educated. Uh, I don't know how well that went over, but uh, sometimes you still, you get an older priest uh, will say to you, oh, that's not, don't worry about that. That's not too bad. You know, that's not a sin. You, God doesn't worry about that. Uh, that's the fundamental option, which is really a manifestation of Manichaeism. And so Peter of Verona was willing to die for the one faith, the one faith that says Jesus came to redeem not only my soul, but he also came to redeem our bodies. And so therefore, body and soul uh, created by Almighty God to live in holiness and to live in faith. And so it's living the penitential life, prayer and penance and charity, uh, that we progress along the path of salvation. So we pray that on this feast of St. Peter, God strengthen us because so easily we can fall into this trap uh, because the world certainly falls into it. You know, it doesn't matter what you do. Uh, as long as you love God or as long as you love your neighbor, uh, as long as your mind is right, you know, you think pious things, that's all that matters. You hear people say that today. Uh, what you do does matter and matters tremendously. Uh, and so we believe in, in the full redemption. And so therefore, just as our mind and our soul has to be right with God, so even in our physical life, we must strive to be right uh, with Almighty God, if we are to enter into that heavenly kingdom. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.